<laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to kick off the Q&A with a couple of questions myself. So if you have any kind of formulating, you, you know, you can have a bit of time before you say them. Um, so my first one is, how do you see the relationship between art and activism? Start off with a nice light, easy <laughs> one. <laughs> um, hello, uh, it's my kid, and um, you've not met me yet. Um, I, I think, actually, for me, that relationship was encapsulated in uh, Kavdala's last poem about um, joy and joyousness. And I think, um, for me, joyousness is underestimated as a force of resistance. Um, I know, personally, I had often resisted the idea of being, for example, in a crowded space full of people holding banners shouting. That is my worst nightmare, really. And I was like, oh, I must be crap at activism and stuff because I don't want to do that. And then I realised that actually doing a joyous poem or a sad poem can, can equally be that. So I think I'm beginning to realise that um, the arts and activism can open up different ways of feeling and resisting, maybe, that, uh, that, are, that are often very bodily and very happy or joyous. Um, for me, arts and activism go hand in hand um, because through my poem, I guess I can only speak from my experience. Um, I write about the things that are important to me, the things that hurt me, as well as to educate people. And throughout human history, you know, we've always been very active people. Even if we're just going to, um, to protest, you know, the signs that people write is very poetic, you know, asking people to do this. It's, there's also a satire and a, a bit of, you know, um, humour in them. Um, and I think we also explore it through dance, we explore it through music. Um, I think us as human, we use like arts and dancing and everything has always been part of the human bone. Um, so I think we express that well, even if it's just, if we have a dancing group or if we have a, a poetry group, or if we have a writing group, or whatever we do, um, I think they've always been interlinked and I don't know, I just, I guess, I just feel like it's a very important thing uh, to remember um, with us. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, so the next one is, um, what are some of the current issues that you're thinking about to do with gender in particular at the moment? <laughs> um, issues with gender. Okay, like I said, uh, I can only think from my issue with the world, I guess. But I think it just depends from the background that you come from. Like, it wasn't a couple of years ago until uh, FGM was abolished, where I come from, abolished, oh my god, uh, where I come from, and um, I don't know, I feel like there's certain issues that sort of cross, because the issues that are related to gender with my mum is completely different to me, um, and some of those issues, I think, oh, I want to say like the biggest one that most people tend to say is gender pay gap. Um, but also for me, I guess, it's fighting for equality within that gender pay gap. Um, there, was a re there was a report released by McKinsey yeah. about the workplace and it was showing Latino women, black women, white women, uh, white men, black men, and all that. And it sort of showed that and it's just the sort of the, the rating of the pay sort of decreased. So as a woman, I already get paid less, paid less, but as a black woman, I'm paid even less. So I think whatever issue I have as a woman, even though they're the general issues that we have, but there's always layers that like that penetrate with race. Um, so uh, I don't know. I guess it's just a worry. Uh, I guess so. I guess for me, with, with the issues that are that revolve around gender, for me, um, I don't really know. I guess I think. That I don't look like a very. That sounded like lots of knowing and lots of beautiful stuff. Yeah. Um, and can I can I answer in a? I'm going to answer in a list form. I think. Um, one, I'm thinking about neurodiversity and gender because I'm aware of lots of fellow neurodivergent people, um, who uh, particularly as uh, women, uh, uh, find it particularly hard to get diagnosed or recognised for their neurodiversity. So that's a thing. Two, I'm thinking about regionality and 
gender because I'm doing a show about northern women at the moment called Where There's Muck There's Bras um, <laughs> that cannot be pronounced well if you have a southern English accent <laughs> so you don't say brass properly um, and, uh, and actually in the north of England on all intersections of social and economic equality we are lower. Um, three, is, I'm thinking, ooh, is gender even going to be a thing? in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to the end of gender, of course. Um, I've forgotten the thought now. <laughs> Great, thank you. Great answers. Um, so any questions from the audience now? After some time? <laughs> After some giant it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be about feminism. It could just be about what you want to know, anything about Maybe if you want to know more about Kate's project, for example. Where my shoes are from. <laughs> <laughs> they are good shoes. Where's she she dressed like from? Where's my dress from? <laughs> it's um, a Lindy Hop dress. Oh, wow. Yeah. You can't Great taste. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was my that was the fourth thing. Actually, sorry. <laughs> Just, well, because there's all, there could almost be. Oh, but we're loving a dress. Oh, is that proper feminism? But yes! Joy and style and dresses and colour. And um, it's taken me ages and ages to get over loads of my resistances to, to, to how to be a feminist and what that means. And, um, you know, uh, I think a lot of... Um, uh, there's a certain strand of feminism that's, that's very, I suppose, a, can we say a, a lipstick feminism that was quite excited by buying stuff and I'm not excited by that but I am excited by shiny things and colours and dresses and how does this all fit um, and, and I think it's okay to, to be conflicted and confused about what feminism is and yet still kind of make an effort to do it. Yeah. I agree with you on that now that you've said that. Um, I have two younger sisters um, and I feel like for me it's educating them about from a young age about st sticking together with their female friends or wherever they are um, from and just making sure because obviously growing up for me like you see other other girls sort of like slot shame in the playground and you know it's a shame to say like us as girls as well we join in saying oh they wear this they wear that but actually teaching them from a young age that like, that's not acceptable um, it's important that you stick by your friends whatever they want to wear whatever they want to look like and it's important to also address your role within that and make sure that basically your girls are all you've got <laughs> so I tell her <laughs> um, and uh, make sure that you support no matter what if you see someone being slut shamed or um, bullied just purely because of who they are then you need to stick up for them because that's something I didn't do so I feel like it's important that I instill that in her so she grows up strong and proud and welcoming of other uh, women, whatever they look like, whatever they want to be. That feels like an applause moment. Yeah, I've got a question. <laughs> uh, my question's for Kauzara and it's about, um, I really love the idea of writing from joy instead of pain and I think we don't, as poets and writers, often do enough of that. And I just wondered if you could talk a bit about the process of whether that was different experience and kind of what that was like, that discovery. It was difficult because, like I said, most of my poems talk about the pain that I've been through being a diaspora, being a woman, being black, being Muslim. So trying to access joy, like even because a lot of the things that I use are trying to compare two things. But with joy, I guess I just needed to tap into the things that were just normal, you know, things that I don't even think about, like going to a like my mum cooking jollof rice and coming home from work and seeing it, you know, or talking to my cousins and remembering how we used to run around and we still have the scars on our knees and trying to think of all the little bits of my life that make me happy, like speaking to my friends when you have a piece of gossip and you're like, ah, I've got something to tell you. And like, pick up the phone, pick up the phone. So even those little things, so accessing that. So I, I guess I just had to tap into that. And I guess I was trying to think of with the poem of Black Joy, um, sort of write about that. But I do want to write more things. Like there was a poem I wrote about conquering my fear of heights as well in Morocco when I went on my year abroad. Um, and height is a big thing for me. So trying to write about um, a good day. We basically ended up at the, at, at the back of a wagon, weaving through the mountains. 
uh, and doing waves and you know that was a good day for me so trying to like write about something like that and exploring all the emotions that came with that and yeah so thank you um so if there aren't any more burning questions or you want to oh yes um, i think one, what i try and do in poetry anyway sort of overcome fear of talking about subjects that women aren't supposed to talk about so do you do any sort of taboo busting in your poetry and how do you do that I don't think I've got there yet, um, but I do want to. I think it's a... So when I started writing poetry, I went from writing things that were basic and very... So writing things like, slavery is bad, colonialism is bad, but actually describing... Because the thing is, it's not my reality yet. Like obviously, there are female issues that are my reality. So trying to take away from that and actually tap into my experiences. So it's been a journey for me. So even writing joy is just... The first stage where I've written beyond pain and sadness, and um, so I will get there. I'm <laughs> sure I will. So yeah, I will, um, and I do want to. And I think it's important that we explore those those issues and uh, those things that women can't talk about because it's so important to us, and it should be normalised um, <clears throat> because we are normal, <laughs> weird and normal. Um, so yeah, that's that's my view. And I think you gave us a great example and a thank you with your mm -hmm. masturbation poem <laughs> to start with. Um, and it reminded me of an exercise that I love doing when I run comedy workshops of um, saying to people, what are you not supposed to say? Yeah. Um, and I think you went, because I love as well how there's the line, like it's not just a performer or a poet makes the line, is it? it's a po poet and the audience together and we decide where the line is and there was the beautiful moment where we were like yes masturbation more women masturbation yes cucumbers bananas oh dry humping your brother oh, 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 that was a line we discovered we had within us we weren't sure about that we all discovered it together thanks to you and um, i just love that that's a joyous process more of that <laughs> choose an, an issue, a topic, and go, I want to tackle this, this is what I need to write about, or do you just enjoy the process of writing and then afterwards realise, oh, I have, I have talked about this topic, or is that binary far too simple for, for what spoken word art could and should be? Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night to write a poem, and then I just start writing, like... I don't really think, okay, I need to write about this issue because the truth is poetry it doesn't work like that. Well, for me personally, sometimes I attend workshops and you write stuff, but the process is far more complicated than that. So there could be something I saw in the news and it triggers my emotions and I'm like, what, what am I going to do? I need to write about it. Um, that's mostly the case for me. Um, it's never a case of let me sit down and write because it's hard for me to do that because it's not organic for me and every poet is different. So if I sit down to write about a topic, the truth is it just doesn't flow and sometimes I don't write for like four months and then sometimes I write for like two months straight and it's great and it's fantastic and within those four months it's just awful so it's more complicated than that because I use poetry as a way to express the things that I'm going through um, so I guess and then by looking at it I realised that I've tackled the things that I didn't even realise I was feeling, or at that time. Because sometimes I write something where it's like anger and then I read it back and I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling this anymore. It's, it's gone now. And then sometimes I write things and I'm like, this is still persistent. I need to just keep going, working through it. And then, like I said with the Agusi poem, when I first wrote it, I was angry. And now I'm just kind of like, at times with it. But it's still a piece that I love because the other day my father was still asking me whether this letter, he wrote it right. And you know, and it's less mistakes than what he used to make, so it's a progress in that. And I guess I have to sort of, with the way I deliver it as well, show that process in, in the way I deliver it. And what about you, Carmina? Because you talked actually about your, how you, you're not a, a regular writer, but you've been challenging yourself with stimulus. Do you ever, are there issues sometimes, or is it more specific situations? I think, yeah, exactly as Zara was saying, like, it's, yeah, just kind of whatever's around me and what I'm going through and definitely, like, with 
one of the poems I said that I still write for catharsis, um, but obviously like when you're writing and wanting to do it somewhat professionally, it becomes a craft as well as you know something that you do for yourself. So um, yeah, I don't tend to yeah like pick out a particular thing that I want to write about. It is more organic. Yeah. What about you? Um, yeah, no, I suppose I have two very distinct types of poems because I do it as a job, so I quite often get commissioned to write things, and I, so I'll, I'll write about anything, uh, although, well, not anything, because I've turned some commissions down of things I didn't want to write about, but, um, uh, so I'm just, uh, so for example, I was just asked to write about a very posh man who um, was attached to a National Trust house, and um, it turns out it was a conservative voting, Nazi appeasing homophobe. And I was like, hang on, why would I want to write about him? <laughs> um, and I basically said that in the email back and I felt really good. I was like, ha, I am a poet of ethics, so I don't just <laughs> take really quite a lot of things, not everything. Um, so there's public things and commissions, but then I have kind of private poems, I suppose. Um, I've been wanting to write about um, autism for ages. Um, and kind of wanting to write really big issue poems, go, look, this is autism. And actually, the way I've ended up writing about it is in my much more small, non-commissioned, not public poems that are going in a collection um, that are mainly coming out of um, a relationship that I'm having with a fellow autistic person. Um, that is unexpected. Uh, uh, the way I thought I, I wanted to write about it is not the way I've been able to write about it. And I suppose that's often a sign that something's working well, probably, if if your writing leads you off down a different garden path than the one you were meant to be going down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask a follow-up to that then? Because I've, I've read research that says that if you're commissioned as an artist to produce a piece of work, it's actually potentially not as creative or as successful. So would you say that you're less proud of the work you've produced that you've been commissioned to produce? <laughs> um, I have one commission coming up and then I have another one that I've just done with the BBC. So that one was completely free form. Um, sometimes they commission you to write something that's completely free form. So this was my idea. Right. And then the second one is I'm going to be writing for a festival in Tapton Lock. Um, and trying to get the local Bain community to get involved. I've never written about flowers or anything like that. You know? <laughs> so this is going to be a learning curve for me. There's some, I feel like the work that you do, sometimes it's a challenge because it's not something you write about mm. and it's completely outside the box, but you have to do it because it makes you versatile as an artist. So obviously I've never written about like the natural environment. Like I said, my poems are sometimes sad. So even this is a challenge for me to explore and to enjoy the natural environment and write it in a way that's that's beautiful. So I think it can be a chance. So like you said that there'll be some stuff that you're commissioned for and you say no, and there'll be some stuff that you re you do get excited about because it challenges you and it makes you think beyond. Like I plan on getting involved in every workshop even though I'm delivering it. Um, because I think it'll make me a better, it makes some, it makes you a better writer. Mm. And I, I think for me, um, so I'm a regular on um, the Radio 3 programme, The Verve, and I do a lot of commissions for them, and they are my favourite um, outlet for commissions, because actually they are happy with whatever style I write in, they're not mm. saying, you know, be really accessible or be really obscure, I can be just who I am, which is probably a mixture of the two, and they'll set me a topic that I would never have written about, like slime mould, of all things, which turns out to be the most fascinating thing, slime mould basically has its own mind and sets off in networks, and I could go on, oh, but anyway, basically, um, wrote that poem, loved it, wrote a poem about the moon landings, wrote a poem about goodness, um, and trees, all things I would not have written about, and actually I'm proud of all those poems, um, but it's because I somehow, they give me a space to still be me, mm. and I, I think I would, I, I think there's a temptation very early on in your career, or, or actually at any point where you're just trying to get on and you really need the money, of course there's a temptation just to accept a commission and just think, oh I'm grateful for the work, and not really uh, be aware of, of 
how far you might be compromising yourself mm. and actually maybe because I've done a lot now and I feel quite strong about not compromising mm. myself um, I'm still able to keep my creativity if you mm. see what I mean mm. but I mean, it seems to be a, a tightrope walk sometimes mm. I mean have you ever felt as a commissioner ever asked you to, to change something in a way you weren't happy with maybe no even with the BBC because I only just started doing commission work even with the BBC stuff that I uploaded, they told me there were parts of it that was that needed editing. Um, I think it's a two-way conversation. Um, so when they wrote it to me, I was like, what do you mean my work is like this? <laughs> but at the same time, I was like, willing to take the feedback, but I was like, no one's ever said that to me before. What do you mean? But then when he explained it over the phone, I sort of understood what he meant, and I could see the little parts that I needed to sort of change. But you, you sort of... I think one thing I'm learning is stick your ground as well with your work. You know, when you've been doing it for a while, so I've been writing poetry since I was 14 and I was saying to Carmina that some of the stuff that I wrote was just atrocious. Like, I look back on it and I think, what? But as you do it more, you realise there are parts that you know when it's finished. You know, feedback to take and you know, feedback to leave. Um, which, which I think comes with, with a, long, like, a lot of experience to do with that. So I did take some of that, but at the same time I was like, Nah, I'm gonna leave it the way, the way it is. Yeah, yeah. What about you? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't really get commissioned too much. Um, I would like to, but um, <laughs> but I, I do think that it is for me much more of a struggle having to to write about a particular thing. I think having that freedom um, of creativity is is really important and. And if it is something that has to be about a particular thing, being able to kind of like work your way around that rather than it being so obvious that it is about that thing as well. Um, well I think um, we've probably got to wrap up the Q&A, so thank you for, for bringing some questions to the table. And